Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Exotic Astrology, and we are extremely fortunate to have with us Michael Lee today. Thank you very much, sir, for coming to Exotic Astrology. And today he will be sharing amazing things about nakshatras, and he has a wonderful YouTube channel. Like we were discussing before <laughs> this talk, that uh, I always watch his videos on uh, the full moon and new moon. Uh, forecast which he keeps making always and I was always amazed to see that exactly and many other people have also told me this that exactly what we are facing uh, what we are feeling actually that he he conveys effortlessly and he was showing me how he does that <laughs> so he also has a beautiful channel so you can please go I will uh, pin the channel in the description and you also do consultations I do. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to go ahead and book a reading, you can always do. I will give the website also in the description. And you have many courses also there. I was amazed to see. So please enlighten us about nakshatras. Oh, I sure will. But you know, I, I, th I, think, I think I'm fortunate. And I've noticed this about <laughs> other people, which is, and I'm not going to give anything away about my chart, other than saying <laughs> that I'm born with my ascendant conjunct the moon. Okay. You see, fantastic. so I have a special connection to the nakshatras because it's okay. just you know, the, <laughs> and I've noticed that people who, who have that, they tend to really connect with it really well. But you know, what I was really wanting to talk to your viewers about today are what the nakshatras actually are, what they do, uh, how they function. Um, and in order to really go into this, we kind of need to understand them astronomically because it's interesting you know there's in ancient texts there's very little written on the nakshatras like in in the rig veda the nakshatras are referred to by the deities there's another really wonderful text that you know a, a couple of people have recently translated and it's called taitariya brahmana and it's part of the krishna yajur veda and it's probably the if not the oldest it's one of the oldest texts that actually gives descriptions of the nakshatras in it really really wonderful text but um there's not a lot out there on the nakshatras and i find that quite often there's a lot of misunderstanding of the nakshatras because regardless of which zodiac you use a lot of people tend to under the understand the nakshatras as being part of the zodiac but in actuality they're not they're not part of the zodiac they're a completely separate thing but they're joined together with the zodiac for the sake of horoscope interpretation okay so basically the zodiac what the zodiac is is 12 equal portions of the ecliptic so regardless of whether you're using a sidereal zodiac or a tropical zodiac regardless of which system you use Basically, that is determined by the ecliptic being split into 12 equal portions. If you're using a sidereal zodiac, then that is being mapped to the stars. If you're using a tropical zodiac, it, it's understood that it's not being mapped to the stars, that there's a completely different connection that's there. But in essence, what the zodiac is, is 12 equal portions of the ecliptic. Whereas the nakshatras, are taking the heavens, the sphere of the stars, and splitting that into 27 sections, or if you're using Abhijit, it's 28. Um, but really, Abhijit, in my opinion, is part of Utada, Ashada Nakshatra. So they're completely different things. And there's actually, you know, part of this, I think, misconception comes from different interpretations of Brihat Parashra Hora Shastra. Because even though we're fortunate to have Brihat Parashra or Horus Shastra now, the text that we have was recompiled in the 19th century from different portions that were taken from different people. So in other words, the person who uh, was responsible for this text found one portion of the text and then upon finding that one portion was able to find other portions from other sources and then put it all together. So some of those portions were a little bit um, more corrupted than others were. 
And so we have some really wonderful things from Parashara, but if you've read Brihat Parashara or Horus Shastra enough, you understand that there are some things that you kind of look at and you go, well, I've tried that and it doesn't work. And of course, Parashara wouldn't give us something that doesn't work. And those are usually the things that were, uh, were added later on. But equally, there are so many different translations of Brihat Parashara or Horus Shastra. And there's one mainly that uh, most people are familiar with. And in that particular translation, it is listed as saying that the nakshatras are part of the zodiac. When in essence, that's really somewhat of a misinterpretation. Because when the uh, nakshatras are mentioned in that early portion of Brihat Parashara or Hora Shastra, and I'm not going to say which chapter because dependent upon which translation you have, it's a different chapter. But basically, uh, Parashara says that the sky is full of Jyoti Bimba, or dots of light, which are of two different types, which are nakshatras and grahas. So, you know, the nakshatras and the planets. Now, obviously, the planets move. And if we were to observe this every night, we'd see, you know, obviously the planets moving because we know that they move from our particular perspective. Whereas the nakshatras, they tend to stay from an observational perspective more static. So we can note the movement of the planets against the stars. And that's likely why we have, um, well, let me kind of rephrase that. It's understood from most people who work with nakshatras that nakshatras likely predate the use of Rashis because it was something that was able to be observed. You could look each night at the sky and you could note the movement of the planets against the nakshatras, whereas during the daytime, you, you can't really do that, right? So um, if you mark the movement of the planets, which are moving against the nakshatras, which are more static, then that's how we kind of uh, came up with the early um, systems of astrology. They were mainly observational by nature until the whole concept of going, well, you know, it would be nice if we could equally judge the movement of the planets against the sun. And then that's when a whole different system had to come into being and eventually, you know, likely where the use of Rashis became more predominant. But this is all theoretical <laughs> because no matter what somebody tells you, and I'm going to like duck before I catch a lot of flack for saying this, no matter what somebody tells you, we don't really have any certainty of when Rashis started being used. You know, we can see things being written in early texts, but we don't know where astrology comes from. We don't. You know, so we can only theorize because we don't really have any hard, concrete evidence that lets us know. So going back to Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra. So there's a particular word that's used in that translation where he uses the word to, which means but. And he lets us know that the same sky can equally be divided into 12 Rashis. So this particular section of Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra often gets misinterpreted to be understood as the nakshatras and the zodiac are the same thing. So because he's talking about divisions of the sky containing nakshatras and Rashis. But in essence, what he's saying is that the sky is full of lights, and those lights can be div divided in a couple of different ways. It can be divided into nakshatras, and it can also be divided into rashis. And in essence, the two are different, but for the sake of horoscope interpretation, we join them together. We join them together so that we can understand, like, you know, what's, what's actually happening. And that, that is the an, um, astronomical truth regardless of whether you're using the sidereal zodiac or if you are somebody who is using the tropical sidereal system of Vedic astrology, if you're using that, again, those two things are separate. Okay, so if we understand that those two things are separate, then we come to another concept 
that I, you know, really want to share with people, which is, it's also mentioned in Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, how the planets are conscious incarnations of Vishnu. And how uh, Vishnu incarnated as the planets um, plays with us. <laughs> uh, I think he uses the name for Vishnu Janardana which is the one who agitates man, right? And he agitates us by making things happen in our life. But the planets are conscious incarnations of Vishnu. So they're conscious entities. Whereas it's mentioned elsewhere in Brihat Parash or Horus Shastra that the Rashis or the signs are unconscious limbs of Vishnu. Okay, so think about that. When you die, what do you have? You just got this body. The consciousness has left it, right? And consciousness has left it. So it's a similar thing. If we don't have that consciousness interacting with the body parts, it's just a body. That's all that it is. But the thing is, is planets are always interacting with Rashis. Every single Rashi will have a planet interacting with it in one way, shape, form, or another. So there's always a certain level of consciousness in those limbs of Vishnu. But without that consciousness in it, it's, it's, just, it's just limbs. It's just body parts. Okay? Um, it's referred to as being time personified, right? The Kala Purusha, right? Time personified. So that's very meaningful too because we come here, we've come up with this concept of time. And that's an, another interesting thing. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I'll go down it a little bit. You know, we've come up with this concept of time because, you know, if we didn't have time, how hard would it be to deal with things and integrate things, right? So I once saw a funny thing written, and it, it's actually, even though it's somewhat humorous, it's actually somewhat true, which is, you know, that God created time so that the universe didn't happen all at once. Because if it did happen all at once, think of how, like, intense that would be. But maybe it is all happening at once. Maybe every single day it's all happening at once, because we all only have this one moment, which is now, right? So we all, always only have now. So the universe is all happening all at once, right? But we have this experience of, of time, and time personified on a certain level. That's the limbs of Vishnu. So that gives us an understanding of what the Rashis do. The Rashis are a field in which something operates. Okay, so a planet will influence a Rashi. That consciousness will influence a body part, right? And that field whether that be the Aries field or the Taurus field or the Gemini field, it will condition that planet in a certain way. So we can understand the sun will behave differently in Gemini than it will behave in Taurus. Same with the moon. The moon will behave differently in Taurus than it will behave in Leo. It's going to be, you know, there can be some similarities because those are both fixed signs, Taurus and Leo, but there will be some differences. So basically, the Rashis will condition a planet to be, you know, to behave in a certain way. And then that energy is further fine-tuned to affect a specific area of our life. Hence, the limbs of Vishnu, that's time personified. But in Brihat Parashara or Hora Shastra, we're not really given much on what the nakshatras do. But we can understand the nakshatras pretty deeply if we, if we take this on board, right? So if we understand the Rashis, do the Rashis necessarily have deities connected to them? Well, the interesting thing is, is if you go into your divisional charts, Rashis do, can have deities connected to them on a certain level, or portions of those Rashis can have deities connected to them because there are Varga deities, right? And so a planet in a particular Rashi and in a specific section of that Rashi in the divisional chart will tend to have a particular Varga deity connected to it. But the Rashi chart, you don't have that, but you do because you've got the planets ruling the signs. 
So the planets are incarn they're conscious incarnations of Vishnu, right? So if we understand the nakshatras, they have deities connected with them as well. So that gives us a hint that the nakshatras are on some levels similar to the planets. Where do they have a similarity? They have a similarity in association with the fact that there's consciousness associated with them. Okay? But one of the areas that we really get a very big hint in terms of understanding the nakshatras is by their association with Varuna. And so let's understand Varuna. I know a lot of people aren't familiar with Varuna. Uh, Varuna is a I Vedic think, uh, deity. This Go ahead. we can do in the next video, I guess. That sounds good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Stay tuned, everybody.